This week at Storytime, we're going to talk about what's happening with our investors, how a city is fighting with us on a project, and how to sell a development project. So first off, let's talk what's happening with one of our investors specifically. So right now, one of our investors doesn't want to buy this deal because he can't make it work. And we're all going through this. You need more cash down. The criteria is higher. And the because interest rates are so much higher than they've previously been, that's pinching our cash flow. So he says to me, he says, hey, Anton, I can't make this deal work. And I said to him, well, what should we do about that? And so he's looking at me like, okay, solve my problem. Help me figure out how to make this investment property work. And the reality is, is we're not going to make every single one of them work. So one, what I want you to be thinking about is just find better deals. We talked about this before, but there's not always the best deals on the MLS. Sometimes you're going to have to go hunt them down off the market. You're going to have to go look at multiple properties. But if our criteria is clearly defined, we know what we're looking for. We know what we're going to buy. We can then just start shoving deals through. So number one, go find a better deal. Two, how are you going to hunt for this that is outside of the traditional method? See, if all of our buyers or all other investors are hunting on the MLS, how can you find a deal? Have you spoken with everyone you know and told them, I am a real estate investor and here's what I buy? Have you posted on social media with a call to action about what you buy and how you do it? Did you go buy a hundred bandit signs and put them up all over the city that says, I buy houses for cash or sell me your old broken junk manufactured home? If you're going to get real specific about these things, you can attract more leads. Do you spend time sending out direct mail? Do you spend time creating lists that you can cold call? Don't expect if you didn't put in the work to find a deal. It takes work to find a deal. Lastly, and not everyone wants to hear this, you just need to make more money. Okay, I know you don't like that, but the reality is go make more money. Put more of a down payment. Make it more secure. We don't have to get into everything 100% financed. So maybe this deal didn't work because you were trying to do it at 20% down, but maybe the deal works at 25, okay? Or maybe you're going to get a break in your interest rate if you put down 30%. So go make more money, put better offers out there, and put more down so that you can get better deals. This high interest rate environment is only here for a moment in time. So like we've said before, we believe you're going to have about 12, 24 months left of this. If I can find a good deal today and it's going to get even better in the future, then buy it. And if you have to put more down, so be it. But keep hunting until you find it and don't just give up because it didn't immediately pop out of the woods. Okay, there is story one. Story two, we got a property that didn't appraise. So this is an investment property being purchased by one of our clients because the banking industry has started to tighten down what's happening. Lenders are also being more conservative. Underwriting is being more conservative. So the deal came in $35,000 less than the list price. That is a lot of of money. This particular property is priced around $700,000. It was under contract for $740,000. The appraisal came in at seven oh five, dollars And the investor, their immediate response is all emotion. The deal's never gonna work, Anton. What do I do? I say, well, slow down. First thing we do is we're gonna go fight with the appraiser to see if we can get it to appraise. Sir, do you agree that this property is a good value? Yes. Okay. So let's go fight with the appraiser first. So we call the lender, start working with the appraiser. We submit new comps over to them to justify the higher price. We also have a conversation with the listing broker. And that conversation is really simple. Hey, where do you think this property should be priced? And they said, well, I felt it was priced correctly. And I said, I agree with you. What do you think the seller wants to do? What's more important to this seller? Is it more important to sell the property or to get their price? And the listing broker then says to us, they go, you know what? It's more important for them to sell the property because they're already moving. They're already mentally moved on. And the, the stuff that this property was being used for was already moved into another rental property down the street. So the storage component 
and mentally they were done with this property. So we keep fighting, and here's what's going to happen. The buyer then comes back and says, well, is there another way to do this? And I said, well, where are the down payment funds coming from? And I already knew where they were coming from, but I wanted to have the discussion, okay, to talk the problem out. And they go, well, it's coming from a HELOC. So, so what you're saying is your down payment is coming from debt. Is that correct? Yes, it's coming from debt. So because the down payment is coming from debt, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, does it matter as an investor, if this is debt on your HELOC or if it's debt against the property. And they thought about it and they said, well, it makes no personal difference to me. And I said, that's awesome. So if we can't get it to fully appraise, would you be willing to spread the difference in cash? And they said, absolutely. So I pick up the phone, call the listing broker back and start having a discussion with the listing broker. And I say to the listing broker, I said, hey, would the seller be willing to reduce the price if we can't get this appraisal to come up? And they said, you know what? The seller wants a deal done. We'd be willing to reduce the price. So regardless of if the appraisal comes up, we already have the deal solved through two different methods or a method of bridging the gap where maybe the seller reduces the price a little bit and the buyer comes in with some additional cash. And all of it is still working for the buyer, for the seller, and we're creating a win-win situation. So when you run into that roadblock, when the deal's not working, it didn't appraise, whatever it may be, ask yourself, what are two solutions, three solutions, four solutions to this problem, and how can I work through this and create a win-win situation for all parties involved? Where, you know what, everyone might have to give up just a little bit, but at the end of the day, they're still getting what they want and moving in the direction that they want. Okay. Okay. Next, let's talk about this land use code called reasonable use. And you go, reasonable use, what does that mean? Reasonable use is land use code in the state of Washington that is designed when a property cannot get outside of the wetland buffer. Okay, so imagine this piece of paper is the rectangular lot that you are purchasing. Let's say down the side over here is a wetland. And the wetland buffer covers the whole piece of property. Wetland buffers, you can't build inside of them. So now what do I do? So we went and fought with this city, and the city didn't understand their own code. And the city says, well, that property is all inside of the wetland buffer. So it's basically not, not usable. So we go out there. We get the wetland biologist to take a look at it. And sure enough, it's six old city lots. The wetland touches this side, and it covers every part of of that particular property. So there's no way to get away from the buffer. So we start asking these questions, like to the city engineer, what would you like to see here? His first answer, which pissed me off, was, well, we were hoping the owner would just donate it to the city as land for a park in the future. And in my mind, I'm going, are you freaking kidding me? That's not even on my list because I'm a buyer. I'm the real estate investor. I want to build something on this. We want to develop this property. So I calm down, put the emotion down, think about it. We start saying, well, where do you, would you like to see access to this? And he says, well, the access has not been open. So let's understand something for a second. If access has not been opened for a property... What you can do, even if the access is underwater, which it is in this case, you can apply to the Army Corps of Engineers. Or if it is a localized wetland, in other words, it doesn't have a fallout anymore and it's just some type of a depression, a divot in the property where water naturally goes to, then they would say, you know what, this might be a city permit. But regardless, whether it's Army Corps of Engineers or under the jurisdiction of the local city or the county, you can eventually get a permit to fill those wetlands to put in the road so you could access these properties. 
Of course, that takes a long time. It costs a lot of money. So that's not exactly what we want to do in this particular circumstance. These lots are located in a semi-rural area. It's also an affordable area, so we don't want to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars. Plus, when we fill that wetland, we would still have to do some type of mitigation. You'd have to go buy credits from a wetland bank. You'd have to get another piece of land. So you've got to mitigate. Washington State, we're the evergreen state, and I know other states have stuff like this too, but we're hardcore in regards to our wetlands. So we said to them, well, we know there's an alley to the east of this property. How many units would you allow us to access off the property? And he says, well, that alley is, it's, it's dirt. It's not even paved. And so I said, well, we'd be willing to pave it. How many units would you allow us? And he goes, I don't know. I said, no worries. Would it be all right if we submit a sketch with a pre-application meeting to make a proposal to the city? So what we're doing here is this isn't even a pre-application. We're just having a phone call kind of pre-flighting what we're trying to do to get a thumbs up, a thumbs down, or a schmaybe in regards to our thoughts. That's all we're trying to do with this uh, city planner. The next thing we did was we said, well, what if... We squished it on both of the sides and we pushed it as far away from the wetland as possible. And instead of building six properties there, we put a duplex on each side. We mitigate the wetlands and then we, we basically redo or replant anything that we disturb around there in order to do some on-site mitigation. And he goes, that might work. Boom. We're winning. We're making progress. And we said, okay, do you see any other hurdles? Well, one of the hurdles I see is where's a fire truck going to turn around if they have to come down the alley? So there happens to be at the end of this property another unopened right of way. And I said, well, what if we put a turnaround in the 60 foot unopened right of way that's outside of the wetlands? He says, you know, that might work. I said, what if between the two properties we put a little hammerhead so you could just drive down, pull the emergency vehicle into the hammerhead and drive out the other way? He said, that may work too. I said, what I'd like to do, sir, is I'd like to put down four proposals and I'll write number one, two, three, four. This is our cost, our expense. And we're going to put down four proposals and we're going to submit them all in the pre-app with number one being the one we'd like to do and yet all four of them being something we're willing to do. Is that something the city would consider? So notice we're not telling them exactly what we're going to do. We're not we're not forcing anything down their throat. What we're doing is we're having a discussion about thoughts and ideas and proposals in order to make this work and a win-win for all parties. So Going back to reasonable use, reasonable use is going to allow you to build something inside of the buffer area what's reasonable for the area. What that means is if the average home there is 2,000 square feet, you get to build a 2,000 square foot home. You don't get to build a 4,000 square foot home under reasonable use. And you still have to then replant, revegetate, or buy wetland credits in order to do some restoration for things that you do inside of the buffer area. Like I said before, here in Washington state, we are hardcore about our wetlands and I know some other states are just like this. So at the end of the day, we didn't get exactly what we want. We're probably going to have to give up two of the six building lots on this project and use that for wetland restoration and additional vegetation and buffer. And we found a reasonable way to work through the project together where we didn't have to go fight head to head with the city. And we got them to agree with our thoughts, our ideas, our proposal. A mistake so many people make is one, they don't know enough about the code to sound intelligent or to ask the right questions. Two, when they get in these situations, they just go fight with the people instead of acting curious. Go in there just like Columbo. Even if you don't do know, pretend you're dumb and go, well, what would it look like? Or, hey, I was just thinking, we want to try this. Mr. Person who's going to make the decision about my plan, how do you feel about that? And as they give you feedback, listen, write it down and use that feedback to help negotiate 
an amazing deal. So last but not least, I want to talk about selling a development project. So a lot of what happens when you get a development project together, it's about how you package it and how you put it together and how you present it is going to de massively determine the value you get. So when you sound intelligent and know what you are talking about, the buyer understands and feels that authenticity and your confidence and they perceive that confidence as competence. So they go, you know what? I feel very comfortable purchasing this land development project from Anton and his team. So we're going to go through a list and I want you to focus on a few things. So this list has 14 items with the last two being the most important. And what I want you to be thinking about during the whole process of this list very specifically is I need to focus on high communication and high understanding of both what I have, what I'm selling, what the buyer will do with it, and then how that relates to the market and the pricing. So number one, you got to create a quick, short pitch about the property. You need to be able to, and this particular property was or is a townhome project. It is through the entitlement process. So in other words, they could go pick up the grading permit and start turning dirt on it tomorrow. It's ready to rock and roll. All of the entitlements are done. So this is like as done, done as you can get before you start moving the earth. In that quick short pitch, I need to be able to explain the project in like 20 seconds. What a mistake I see people make is they go into these long drawn out things about it. You need to pop the elevator pitch that you can just hit them with real quick and then start asking them questions because as they start answering those questions, they start buying into your ideas about this development project. You're going to need a OM or an offering memorandum. What is that? An offering memorandum is a five page pitch deck. It's just a couple sexy photos, a little information about the market, what entitlements are done, and maybe a little snapshot of a spreadsheet on there showing them the type of returns. And then you're going to need a little disclaimer that says, these returns are not guaranteed and are simply projections. Always include the disclaimer. Next, you're going to want pictures of the site. I'd recommend overdoing the pictures. So we want 40 pictures of the site. I want drone footage. I want looking up the street that way, looking down the street that way, looking straight across, okay? Make it so that when you send this project out, the buyer can look through so much information, they have a quick understanding and they can make a decision. With the pictures and the video, take time to put good nomenclature on them, AKA a naming system. Street view looking north, street view looking south, street view looking east directly across from the property. Aerial from the north, aerial from the south, neighborhood to the east. I know this sounds tedious. Your attention to detail and little things like this nets you more money. And guess what? I'm not always the person that does it. I just simply make the directions. Copies of all entitlements. So usually what we do is we put this into a Dropbox. Inside of there, you're going to want to break it into sections. You want to break it into uh, the site plan, the civil construction drawing, the structural drawings, if you have drawings for the buildings. You want to break it into the bids. You want to break it into review one, comments one, review two, comments two, review three, comments three. You want to label each one. My personal pet peeve when I'm looking through someone else's development project is I open it up and there's 50 files in there and nothing in there has a legible name on it or can you read it. And so you have to sit there and go, oh my goodness, I'm wasting time. And so for investors and high performing individuals, is their time money? So when you're wasting their time, they're immediately starting to downgrade the value of their project. 
You need to package this thing up all nice and beautiful on a silver platter and serve it up to them perfectly and make it easy for them to digest. You also want a copy of all the process started. So in this particular one, everything was done. But if you've started something like the power plan or the landscaping plan and they were not finished, you would put that in a started folder and you show them what you've started, even if you only got a bid. You want to give them a copy or a list of everything that is completed. So generally speaking, we put that together as a separate checklist of bullet points of everything that's completed. We also then give them a list of knowns and a list of unknowns. A list of knowns could be, you've got to put in 180 feet of sidewalk on the north side of this property. You've got to install a sewer line at this many feet this long. You need to extend this water main. By the way, there's eight trees in the back. Those trees are going to have to be taken down. Example of unknowns. Hey, this property has a higher water table, so you may not be able to do this in the winter. Unknown. There is a latecomer's fee. We haven't figured out exactly what the latecomer's fee is. Please go check and figure that out in your due diligence. If I serve this up once again on a nice digestible platter, when I give it to them, they're immediately going, they know what they're talking about. They know what they're doing. I can work through this quickly. Also, you want to tell them the lists of challenges or things they should watch out for. If you know what you're doing, you know things are going to run into. Make them aware of it up front. See, if you do all this, when that developer shows up or the builder, whoever you're selling it to, see, they're going to want a 90-day feasibility. If I've done all this homework, I can shorten this down to a 30-day feasibility. They have no reason to drag their feet. And if they are going to drag their feet, call their bluff. Here's what you say. You literally go, hey, you know what, Timmy? Everything's basically done on this one. So I'll give you 30 days to check the numbers. But other than that, we don't want to sit around and wait. Okay, you've got to be willing to push back because in this world, you are swimming with sharks and vultures. You know, they are real people when they're spending these types of money. I also like to put together the five strengths of the project and the five weaknesses of the project. See, the five strengths may be the area, the type of product that you're building there, the time of year you're going to be starting the project. The weakness may be, well, in today's environment, high interest rates. It may be one of the neighborhood uh, neighbors is all boarded up. It may be that um, you know there's uh, noise that comes from a machine shop down the road. Whatever they are, they're gonna figure it out anyway. So just tell them up front. Tell them up front because it shortens your timeline. These are the last two, and these are the most important. You need a list of what other properties are like that one that sold and what they sold for. See, if you know that they sold for X price per square foot or X price per, per lot, and you know how much it's going to cost for them to create the building pads, you're ready to rock and roll, and you know all of the challenges that they're going to run into. Also, you need to know the finished product. So this goes back, when you make the elevator pitch, you start asking them questions. What do you see yourself building here? How would you do that? What does that look like to you? Have you done these types of projects before? So now that I understand what they're going to do, what I can do in my basic sales process is I can talk to them about in this example, a townhome project, well, those units are going to be worth about $650,000 apiece finished. You should be into them approximately this much. This should be your approximate profit margin. With this particular example, this was a builder who has been building in our area for 35 years. And you know what he said? Anton, I want to let you know, one, this is the best communication we've ever received on a development project. Two, you absolutely seem to know the market and what is happening. And three, this is going to make it so we could probably get our our due diligence done in three weeks and close in the next 30 to 45 days, just like you guys want. And I said, thank you, sir. That's awesome. This is the same process we go through every time we do one of these. If you found this helpful or if you have any questions of your own, hey, put them in the comments. Send us an email. We're happy to answer more of these questions. Also, if you enjoyed this content, please like and subscribe because that helps us do more. Thanks again.